working together with God in the spirit, of course, is their convicting. <clears throat> spirit, spirit is their influencing, convicting at all times. You're not saving yourself by coming clean, but you are able to produce deeds worthy of repentance. See, once somebody's brain is sealed under this deception that God's got to do it all for them, it's not of works, it's faith alone, well, they're going to, it's almost impossible for them to escape this because they forfeited their most basic human instinct, the ability to act, the ability to offer God a more acceptable sacrifice. Well, Cain's acceptable sacrifice, or Abel's acceptable sacrifice, by which he attained witness that he was righteous, we had nothing to do with sin, as I can see in the Scripture. But yours would be a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God as your reasonable service, presenting your body as a living sacrifice, crucifying the flesh with its passions and desires, dying in that repentance unto life. That's what it means. What's he mean, repent, granted the re Gentiles repentance unto life? Well, repentance is where you're going to come through that process, die out. You don't come into Christ and then slowly die out to sin. You don't come into Christ and then sin less and less. So that's the fallacy where many people are trapped under, thinking that they're saved in Christ while they're still defiled, they're still returning to their vomit as we pound upon over and over again. So you have the ability to act. You forfeit that, and you're under delusion. And we found that very few people can come out of that. See, Abel, he used his ability to offer God that more acceptable sacrifice than his brother. And just like it talks about in 1 John 3.12. He says, why did Cain murder his brother? Well, because his, his deeds were wicked and his brother's righteous. There's always been this contrast throughout all of Scripture between righteousness and wickedness. The highway of the upright is to depart from evil. He that keeps his way preserves his soul. The scripture says, keeps his way. He that walks that highway, that strives through that narrow gate. See, you don't, no one that strives through that narrow gate in, in that repentance brings along pride and arrogance or malice and hatred and pounding their chest like a Pharisee. No, it doesn't happen. Anyone that's come through that narrow gate doesn't bring that kind of baggage with them. That baggage and those dispositions were crucified in repentance. You draw near to God and He'll draw near to you. You cleanse your hands, you sinners. And you purify your heart, you double-minded. You humble yourself in the sight of God and He'll lift you up. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. See, that's when you draw near to God. He's asking you to come reason. He's asking you to draw near. He's not going to affect repentance when you're not willing to repent. He can't override your will. See, that's what happened with the people that refuse to come to God. See, the worst sin of all to them is to make the effort, to walk worthy, to do well. That's the worst sin that they can possibly commit because they're saving themselves. See, the Scripture talks about this doing well in, in, in not only in Genesis chapter 4, but throughout. I mean, you go through De Deuteronomy, you'll see it num on any number of times that it may be well with you if you keep his commandments, if you walk in his way. Noah, he did well when he offered God an acceptable sacrifice after the flood. See, again, because he had the ability to do so, he did so. He put forth the effort to draw near to God and to offer him that sacrifice in obedience from his heart. So you come and reason with God. You draw near to God. You seek the Lord while he may be found. You call upon him while he is near. You let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy on him, and my God will abundantly pardon. See, the promise is always pardon, but not this cheap grace thing that you're filthy rags and there's no deeds required in faithfulness. Romans chapter 4 doesn't teach that you're justified in your sins. Certainly he justifies the ungodly. Well, how else would you need to be justified? Only the righteous have no need of repentance. 
I don't see, I don't see the righteous. He says the, the blessed it is over one sinner. The angels rejoice over one sinner that repents, not over 99 righteous that need no repentance. So the ungodly is certainly that come into a right relationship with God. There's no saying, there's no indication in Romans chapter 4 that Abraham remains ungodly, that David remains ungodly. I know you love to use him as an excuse for your sins, but he's a very rare case of restoration in the scriptures. Abraham had a pattern of obedience, walked in the steps of faith, did the deeds of faith, was fully persuaded in his faith, fully faithful in his faith. That's why James talks about he was justified by what he did and not by faith alone. So it's not teaching that you're justified in your sins by isolating one portion of Scripture. When Jesus said it was made perfectly clear throughout that it was the deeds done that determines who enters the kingdom and who doesn't. <clears throat> God will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality. That should be the end all of the discussion, but so many of you just will not accept it. To those that are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, they'll have indignation and wrath, and tribulation and anguish on every soul that does evil. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone that does good or does well. Again, doing well or doing evil. You can't escape works. You can cry not of works all day long, but you're doing the works of iniquity perfecting sin in your life, thinking that's acceptable to God because you can confess 1 John 1, 9 all the time. And then just pick up where you left off again and again and again. Well, how's that any kind of a relationship with God? It's certainly not a relationship within a marriage. And that's what it's likened unto, the ransom is likened unto a covenant marriage relationship that we enter into based on our faithfulness to the end. See, the gift of eternal life is held in trust. It's held in earnest. It's like it talks about in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, in 2 Corinthians 1. It's held in earnest until the hope is the hope of eternal life in the age to come, yet to be reaped. You don't have eternal life now. You have Christ abiding in you if you're walking in purity and righteousness and holiness all the days of your life, yes. You have that hope, that assurance that that hope is in Christ. Certainly, but not if you're sinning all the time. There's no hope in that at all. So not doing well in rebellion towards God is not going to enter the kingdom. So if you do well, will you not be accepted? Yes, of course you will. If you do well, if you come clean with God, if after you come clean and you have true redemption, you're filled with the Spirit, and then it should be joyful to walk in obedience to God. It's not burdensome to keep His commandments. It's, it's not a heavy yoke upon the back of a person. My yoke is easy. My burden is light, He said. My commandments are not grievous. Why? Because you've been washed clean. You've been purified. But if that's not evident in your life and your conduct, well, then how, how has faith or grace or the free gift done you any good? See, it's been without purpose. If you're still addicted to your vile habits, if nothing tangible is apparent in your life, that you're just a professed Christian and you're no perf nobody's perfect, just forgiven, you're still doing the same things you did before, the same things the world does, you're still addicted to your worldly activities and your sports and your football and all the rest of it, then how is it pretending that you have life in Christ of any value? It's a joke to the world. They see the hypocrisy. See, it's a farce, and you are a fool for believing that God doesn't require your deeds to enter the kingdom, or that you're not a slave to whom you obey. See, why does God freely forgive, not of works, through the blood of Christ, our past sins, when we repent? And forsake them. Why does he do that and then turn around and demand patient continuance and well-doing to enter his kingdom in judgment according to deeds? Well, why is that? See, you know, many people don't understand the difference between the works of the law and the deeds of faith and how they differ in Scripture. 
Well, see, the simple answer is because the one thing that you cannot do, remit your past sins. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you can offer. There's no sacrifice that can be made that we can make and that can remit our past sins. So the one thing that we can't do, He doesn't require us to do. He gives us as a free gift. He doesn't demand what we cannot do. But the one thing that we are able to do, if you do well, to produce deeds worthy of repentance and walk in faithfulness towards God, He requires. That's why. So the one thing we can't do, remit our past sins, only through the blood of Christ by coming clean and being washed clean of that, He doesn't demand of us. He offers to us as that gift held in earnest with the sealing of the Spirit. Earnest is, is a down payment. It's not a guarantee. That's why, that's why eternal life's a hope in the age to come yet to be reaped. But the one thing that we're able to do, which we've already been, if you do well, deeds worthy, rule over it, a good and honest heart towards God, be a faithful servant in patient continuance and well-doing, that he requires. And that's why he says God is going to render to each one according to his deeds. And it says this about 14 times in the New Testament, all the way up to Revelation 22. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me. The reward's eternal life, folks. My reward is with me. Not rewards. My reward is with me. To give to each one according to his deeds. His deeds done in faithfulness. See, well-doing in the Scripture is defined as ergon, a work, like labor. Like going to work and getting a paycheck is, is the same word. See, people that come to the light and flee from those past sins and come clean with God, understand the difference between doing good and evil. Just like it 